And if, if you have comments and questions, I'd love to hear it. How do I stop share? Here we go. Tamash, thanks very much uh, for your uh, exciting and thought-provoking talk. And uh, now we have uh, some time for, uh, for discussion. So please, uh, who would like to ask, uh, can you send your uh, questions to the chat? And uh, then I will uh, let you to ask either directly or I will read the questions. So before the, uh, before the others uh, will write down their, uh, their questions, uh, I would like to ask one. Uh, Tamash, why you call it ma matriocracy actually, because uh, all what you were discussing was actually movement to equality. So uh, that's what I didn't get really. I think that we are moving towards a system in which there is a female, there's going to be a female advantage. So women, if we are going to be in a world in which the social network capital in a gender equal world in which the social network capital is going to be more important than physical wealth, like in, in hunter gatherer forger societies, then the, the sex, and I'm using this very carefully rather than gender in this point, I might have messed it up earlier, but in this particular, I'm, I'm very careful with that. Uh, the, the sex difference in longevity, longevity and the likely sex difference in managing social networks will end up with a stronger, uh, with, a, with, 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 with a sex difference in social capital. At the same time, what we see is that the educational education of women is a higher uh, number of years, uh, and female leadership is increasingly uh, giving gains over male leadership. I should put it differently, feministic leadership rather than female leadership. Because I think that one of the important things that we are going to see and we are seeing now is that not only women are more, female leadership is more feministic than masculine. I think male leadership is often turning towards more feministic than masculine. And, and so this is why I think it's, it's sort of justified to use this term. Do, do you not buy this? Well, uh, we will see, we will see. Uh, <laughs> but we may, we may not uh, see it ourselves. Uh, uh, it might, we might wait for, uh, for our grandsons and granddaughters. Uh, anyway, so we do have uh, one new question. Um, but uh, you expect also the changes in mating system because you, for instance, mentioned uh, polyamory. So what, uh, on what you base this? On, yeah. Right. It's, so we see, it seems that some form of, of polyamory uh, existed under strict marriage rules, several parts of the planet. So, I mean, depend on what you mean, what we mean by polyamory. I mean, in France, uh, the, you know, the uh, extra pair paternity, you know, we, we have some historical data how uh, in French speaking Belgium, 150 years ago, the uh, extra pair paternity was higher than in, in, the, in the Wallon speaking Belgium. Uh, we have now data that in today's populations, several, you know, unpublished data, because you're, you don't get the ethics for this, around 4% of, of kids born to stable couples are, are uh, not the biological children of the fathers. 
some of the data comes actually from here in Estonia for hundreds of thousands of people on two different separate uh, language groups and it's the identical number. We, we see that couples break up, they don't last. And we see the pattern that very often there is a, a secondary partner parallel to the first. And on top of this, we see a maybe fashion, maybe reverting to the baseline process of sort of the Californian polyamory rules spreading around. Tell me, you, you're shaking your hand. Tell me what you think. <laughs> uh, well, uh, of course, human species is extremely variable and uh, we can... Uh, we can, it is like going to supermarket. So if you want to uh, find some evidence, then uh, you would find some, but uh, the, it is a matter of question how um, actually frequent this is. And uh, what we see is that uh, uh, these arrangements, uh, I'm not speaking about uh, polygyny, and uh, but polyamorous relationships are, uh, even in very liberal uh, countries like in uh, California, uh, quite unstable and rare to the rest of the society. So, yeah. So, I mean, it depends on what we mean by polyamorous. So if we mean by polyamorous, the Californian rules, that there are several long-term relationships at the same time, everybody knows about it and agreed to it. So consensual non-monogamy with transparent uh, rules and transparent actions, uh, then I would agree with you that's still uh, a minority, although I observe that it's spreading fast. But if you think, if you start really relaxing these and you say, all right, so what you have, what you can have is secondary partners next to primary partners, uh, what you can have uh, is, is that they are, uh, the, the primary partners follow in each other with an overlap. Uh, then, and you can you know, add that maybe not uh, uh, consensual no monogamy or part consensual, maybe the rules are consensual, but the actions are, the rules are transparent, the actions are not transparent. So if you weaken that Californian version and all you request is that from the polyamory phenomenon is that there are parallel sexual relationships or at, le at least emotionally uh, love relationships or whatever. I mean, we're going back to this question of what is a relationship. Uh, uh, then, then I think we, we have a, a pattern here in front of us. Um, but yeah, we will see. So we do have uh, some more questions. Uh, uh, Lukáš uh, would like to ask. Hey, so uh, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Uh, I would like to, to ask about uh, the declining fertility. So you correctly said that it's not, uh, it's against what we would expect it from resources, yeah, but you count it only like energy, like for food, food resources are food but anything what is limiting is a resource so here probably like time investment per offspring is the limi limiting uh, factor so uh, i am uh, asking in these uh, what we observe this shift from say our strategy or fast lives to like slow strategy k, k strategy doesn't mean in fact that we should expect much stronger competition for both both sexes so how are okay so i i will start with a uh, with just admitting that i do not quite understand why fertility is falling i mean i can see many of the proximate mechanisms uh but it's weird. I mean, we can see that women are postponing uh, childbearing. Um, the uh, baby fever comes in at age 29 and a half, it seems. Uh, and then uh, that's, the, that's the point where women very often, uh, not the majority, but not everybody, will have a baby fever. 
but these women are engaging in sexual sexual sex beforehand, or m- most of them, but of course using contraception. So there is a pattern there that I think we have solved this actually with Anna Rotkir, we, we've been working on this and I think we sort of solved that bit. Um, but still then women could have more than one or two kids and, and they have fewer. So there, there's a decision element there. Um, uh, weirdly, maybe uh, doggies uh, reduce the number of kids. Like they, they, we have these cues out there that might have been, might, might be cues for, for you know, being kids around. And it's been, it's also an anecdotally, f- but often described process that women who, who would have a baby fever for a third or fourth child would have a, a puppy instead. Um, and then suddenly they don't have the baby fever anymore. So I, I don't quite, I don't think that we entirely understand uh, how it started. Again, I don't quite see how it, 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 it happened. So once we have an education process going on, I think I and un- I think I, I understand it, but I don't be- buy any of the start of the fertility decline in the you know in eighteenth century France and then in nineteenth century Western Europe. I I don't personally buy any of the the hypotheses that, that are there. I know that there are deep believers <laughs> in the different versions, um, but uh, what do you think? What is your favorite uh, mechanism? So my f- favorite uh, is that per offspring we need we spend much more. Sorry for my, for the darkness. I forgot to switch light on. So, <laughs> but my favorite mechanism is uh, the analysis that uh, each offspring now takes much more resources than individual offspring in the past. So we need much much more time and energy in words, say calculating in watts, uh, like any any resource uh, in joules or watts. Uh, so uh, in fact, our offspring are not taking a lot, a lot of resources. So we cannot have 10 of them as we are forced to invest enormous amount of energy and time to each of them. And uh, still, uh, because we want them to have like good quality life, but it, it needs a lot of resources, a lot of education and loss of parental investment. Mm-hmm. So we can, we simply cannot afford to have 10 well nourished in mm-hmm. any sense uh, offspring and that forced to have as good offspring as possible in a very competitive world. So that's my favorite mm-hmm. explanation. So- as a, as a father of two smelly teenagers, I, I hear your point about this being costly. But my only counter argument, uh, I don't really want to counter argue you, you but uh, they're, they're, you know, my only counter argument is that when societies were in which inequality is higher and, and, and economic competition is stronger, they do not tend to have a lower um, fertility rate than equal societies. In fact, if there's a trend, it's the opposite trend. So higher uh, equality within the society, if let's say measured by the Gini coefficients, does not uh, lead to uh, a higher number of children. So if the, if the mechanism is that um, we need to invest into the kids because of this increased competition out there, uh, which I, you know, uh, I buy, uh, that is clearly there, referring back to the smiley teenagers, uh, but uh, uh, that is that doesn't seem to be so. The data doesn't seem to be supporting at, at least so far uh, that hypothesis. Uh, but uh, that, uh, that some element of that mechanism is clearly there. So it's, I think this is what I'm saying. I at least personally do not know. Um, yeah. Amash, uh, there is another qu- uh, question. Uh, there was a, you were showing figure uh, with number of children uh, around thirty thousand years uh, in the past. Uh, where are these data coming from? Right. So uh, I that was my illustration, and that data is coming from um, uh, the hunter gatherer, uh, the demographic literature 
on hunter gatherers and a demography demography demo, demographic literature on agriculturalist okay uh, so i will um i will continue with i, this I can send yeah, I can, sorry, I can, so these are non-controversial, so I can easily send uh, uh, the papers over mm -hmm. of, of this. Okay, all right. Um, you were showing uh, us that um, uh, patriarchy might be like the uh, most recent end of our evolutionary history and uh, the rest of it, because it's a hunter-gatherers, uh, it uh, might be uh, much more equal. And uh, it's just because we don't see it as it's uh, somewhere in the past. Um, I was wondering, you know, sometimes we treat to um, we uh, treat hunter gatherers as a uh, kind of a same category, but uh, we also see that there are huge differences. And uh, uh, Scholars sometimes tend to uh, select those who, uh, those groups which uh, look more equal, like Hung uh, uh, and uh, uh, and others. But uh, for instance, in um, some uh, some cultural groups in uh, Australia, they they show actually very big uh, shift to patriarchy, and some of the biggest we uh, uh, we see, and uh, so. How would you comment on this uh, on this variation? Yes, uh, so I I agree that there's a variation, and I think the important thing is what happens. So, do we see the same mechanisms going in um, in the in uh, uh, in a, a hunter gatherer case or in the, in the exception, but pointing in a different direction? So I will give two examples. Um, unfortunately, uh, you are so amazing that you actually ask about the Australians and I am desperate to actually go there and figure it out because from the, from the existing literature, I haven't really been so able to sort out what is really going on there. But, uh, but there's another uh, set, uh, exception set, which is the North American uh, hunter-gatherer societies, which are sort of a little bit patriarchal. And there's a weird thing that the more fishing there is in these societies, the more they are patriarchal. If you think about the ecological te you know, technology of fishing, what you need is that you have a particular variable, uh, valuable bit of the environment. Yeah? The, 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 the river uh, 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 bank and a particular important bit of the time when the salmon are fishing up, going up. So that creates exactly the same logic as the logic of patriarchal control. There's a, there's a point, there's, an, there's the, the cost and benefit of containing uh, uh, or controlling a particular area is with physical power uh, points towards uh, more benefit towards uh, from from actual physical control uh, there's another example the other way around yeah so that i was desperate to hunt down agricultural societies that did not turn patriarchal yeah because if this logic is correct then all agricultural societies should have turned patriarchal uh, uh ruth macy's uh work on the mosul actually comes on the back of a of uh, some Chinese anthropologists work, work there. Um, and, and they are squarely patriarchal, uh, matriarchal, yeah? So with uh, uh, full female control of reproduction, uh, no uh, rules around sexuality, uh, no marriage rules. Uh, so there's a marriage practice of a walking marriages, but the men have to arrive after sunset and have to leave before sunrise. Uh, and if you actually go back, what happened there, how this came about, you, know, you can tell a story that there were, the man kept going away, really dangerous mountain uh, 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 pastures with the animals. And the, actually there was a tea route going through here, which was super dangerous. They often got killed. And to this day, when the men go up to the mountain, or the other Chinese state, 
sort of uh, provides security, uh, they say goodbye to the man as if they are going forever. Uh, so you have a particular uh, uh, pattern that you can see how it would give rise to a, a female, the kind of female type of female domination or female control over, over the resources. Uh, and that came together with that area not being particularly valuable and surrounded by mountains. So taking it is, is, is costly, maintaining it costly, and it's not much worse. So having the advantage you know, uh, for the male, the stronger side, the fighting side, more fighty side, uh, is, is, is straightforwardly not there. Actually, you can see some islands when you can, you can, you have see sort of a step towards matriarchy. Some are actually here in Scandinavia where you would have a, a, a long tradition of female dominance. And very often these islands would have fisher men going off to really dangerous um, uh, uh, fishing journeys. So I think these examples, um, uh, uh, strengthen the, the logic with the caveat that this is my slippery way of saying, I do not yet quite understand the Australian example that you brought in. Thanks very much. Uh, there is one uh, related uh, uh, question um, and it's pointing to your figure with uh, green and uh, purple dots and uh, uh -huh. you also uh, you said that most of our uh, past was uh, uh, was matriarchal. So, uh, on what evidence you base this? Uh, gender on equal. Do you with current hunter gatherers? Yes, and I didn't say matriarchal. I said gender equal. So I think we have enough. So I think we have enough data from hunter gatherer societies to suggest that we are not only flexible, but maybe we have a gender equal baseline. So just the way that that chimpanzees actually vary where they are, and bonobos vary where they are. I mean, the bonobo data is much rarer, but there is some variation. So, so different different bonobo groups will will actually vary in the in the female dominance. Well, there are two groups really described. So, those two <laughs> are different in the in the female uh, dominance. So, but I, I think that we have we are flexible. But if we have a baseline. Uh, I think we have data that would suggest that the baseline is, is gender equal. And hence my sweeping illustration of the green dots and the red dots, is which is all it wanted to show is that we, we think that our, society, our species is patriarchal in social organization because where we look around, these are patriarchal societies. These tend to be patriarchal, but they're changing. Thanks very much. Um, if there is not any urgent question. We are discussing already uh, for, or we are having talk and discussion already for one and a half hour, which I think is uh, amazing for uh, concerning the circumstances. And I also can see that uh, behind you, when you started, it was uh, light and now you have uh, proper darkness and uh, bears are coming. So we should really finish, otherwise we will see something horrible. Uh, so. Once again, thanks very much. Uh, it was great pleasure to have you here. We have very much enjoyed it. And uh, for the audience, I hope uh, you will join us next week uh, once again. And uh, hope we will someday meet also in real life. Okay, so <laughs> see you and thanks very much, Tamash. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you and thank you for the great questions and the, and the attention. Ciao, ciao. I'm going to give myself to the bears now. <laughs>